Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Rich Richmond Avenue School. My name is Mahir Sharyar, and I'm an eighth grade student here. I participated in the enrichment program for video and broadcasting, and I want to be an ER doctor when I grow up. I live here in Atlantic City with my mom, my dad, my uncle, and my sister. My parents came to this country from Bangladesh, and they worked very hard to make sure my sister and I are able to achieve our dreams. My mom is a slot attendant at Haras, and my dad works two jobs, one being a security, officers, a security officer at Caesars, and the other being a slot attendant at the brand new Ocean Source Casino. When I'm not studying, I like to read, ride my bike, practice magic, and I enjoy some online gaming, video games that is not poker or anything, just to be clear. <laughs> I want to thank Governor Murphy and Lieutenant Governor Oliver for coming to Atlantic City today and visiting us at Richmond. While Atlantic City is often thought of as boardwalk, beaches, and casinos, our city is much more than that. Over 38,000 people call Atlantic City home. We have, a we have a Stockton University in our backyard. Almost 25% of our residents are under, are under the age of 18. Like me, each and every person who lives in Atlantic City has dreams and goals for the future. Governor Murphy's visit to our school and city shows that New Jersey cares about what comes next for people like me. Because of the support we are seeing from the state and the support I have gotten from my family and teachers, I know that one day I will achieve my goals. I am excited for the future here in Atlantic City and proud to call this my home. Now, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce Governor Phil Murphy. Wow. I don't want to speak, put words in Sheila's, Frank's, or, or Jim's mouth, but I don't think anything we're going to say is going to match what Mahir just said, right? So one more time, Mahir. Please let your mom and dad know we might be giving them a little bit of business later on tonight, by the way, as well. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'll tell you, I am incredibly honored to be here in this historic city, which has played such a unique role in our state's history. I'll talk about the folks up here with me in a moment, but this is a room filled. First of all, I want to thank the Richmond Avenue principal and, and uh, the whole <laughs> educator team. So Ms. Williams, we'll try to behave ourselves. I just want to make sure we get some snack time today while we're here. Uh, honored, honored to be here. The superintendent, uh, thrilled. Uh, the mayor obviously is with us. Members of council means a lot. Sheriff, uh, assemblyman, we'll come to you, John, in a bit. Uh, to uh, freeholders, uh, to the representatives of the county executive, faith leaders, community activists law enforcement, first responders. This is a room full of VIPs. And I know I speak on behalf of all of us that I'm thrilled to be with you. When I ran for this office, I said that I wanted my administration to be a partner in Atlantic City's renewal. I said I wanted us to walk side by side and shoulder to shoulder with elected officials, civic leaders in this entire community. Today, we are living up to our word with a strong, actionable and visionary strategic plan. I made it clear that we could not lift Atlantic City up if the state dictated solutions instead of seeking to be a partner. And I looked for others who shared in that commitment. It is one reason why I asked Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver to serve as our Commissioner of Community Affairs. Perhaps better than anyone in this state, Sheila recognizes both the challenges and promise of our long overlooked urban centers, whether they be in North, Central, or South Jersey. And I knew that she would be a voice for Atlantic City and its residents at a time when they needed, needed champions. I'm the luckiest guy in elected politics anywhere in this country because I get to walk to work every day and work alongside the singular Sheila Oliver. So thank you. <clears throat> It is also why we asked Jim Johnson to serve our administration as special counsel to help position Atlantic City to climb out of the state control it was put under by the prior administration and to put in place the guideposts that will lead to a stronger, more sustainable, and more resilient future. And, and I want to just say that Jim has done an extraordinary job. This report is extraordinary. <laughs> By the way, Jim and I ran against each other, which makes it even more extraordinary. 
we did, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but just, Jim, I'll tell you, you could be doing a lot of things in life, and the fact that you chose to accept this mission in this challenge uh, speaks volumes about who you are, your character, your intellect, your passion, and you've done an extraordinary job. So thank you, pal. Let me start by saying as clearly as I can that Atlantic City is on the rise. There is so much new energy to be found here from the boardwalk to the marina to Chelsea and parts in between. So far this summer, two casino properties were reborn into modern and inviting places for people to come, play, and stay. And with our efforts to legalize sports betting, Atlantic City's casinos now have a new tool to attract new customers. And from the early results, they're doing just that. Stockton University's Gateway Project, which I believe is opening as we speak, has redefined Atlantic City's South End, bringing hundreds of students to live and learn here, while hundreds more are coming in for work at the new South Jersey gas headquarters. On the northern side of the boardwalk, Pauline's so-called Pauline's Prairie, a forlorn, vacant property that symbolized so many years of good intentions but poor execution, has been transformed into 600 North Beach, the first market rate, rate housing in Atlantic City in five decades. And I'm thrilled later on today. I've, I've seen it a couple of times already, but I'm thrilled to go on a tour of that property later today. It's a huge step. This is all progress. It is progress that is diversifying the city's economy while it creates new jobs and new opportunities for residents who have fought and stayed through years of uncertainty, boom, and bust. Now, together with local leaders, we're going to take the next step. And I thank those leaders who are part of this undertaking, and it begins with this guy right here, Mayor Frank Gilliam. Frank, I can't thank you enough for your leadership, uh, particularly as we kind of both got here around the same time. Uh, and you've been a great partner with Sheila and Jim, and uh, look forward to continuing to work with you in the years ahead. And with you, obviously, the entire city council, some of whom are here today. I want to s shout out Council President Marty Small, who's not, School Superintendent Barry Caldwell, Police Chief Henry White, the Atlantic City Fellowship of Churches. I mentioned faith representatives were in the room today. We could not be, we could not ever come close to where we want to be without leaders in the faith community in this town. Um, uh, the NAACP, on uh, whose national board I'm proud to say I formally served. National Action Network, importantly, all the civic organizations who came to the table. And I got to give a shout out to my friend, Nina Langford. And thank you as well. I want to say a shout out to Joe Kelly from the Greater Atlantic City Chamber of Commerce. I also want to recognize the efforts of the legislators, Senator Chris Brown, Assemblyman Vince Mazio, and the youngest guy I know with as many generations under his belt, John Armato, who's in the front row. Finally, I want to thank, I mentioned earlier, I want to thank uh, County Executive Denny Levinson uh, for, in his team for all of their help, Freeholder Chair Frank Formica, and Freeholders in particular, the whole Freeholder Board, but in particular, uh, Ernie Corsi and Ashley Bennett. Um, and there are many others I could thank, but I want to at least make sure I, I give them a shout out. Now, I don't want to steal all of Jim's thunder, and I will leave the details to him. But here are the underpinnings of the plan he has laid out to rebuild faith in Atlantic City's leadership, invest in its people, and continue to rebuild the city's economy. I must note that this review was conducted, importantly, independently, and many of the specific proposals are still being reviewed by the administration. But I'll tell you, we like what we see. Uh, we welcome this much needed, we welcome it, uh, welcome does not do it justice. We are thrilled to welcome this much-needed roadmap uh, to a brighter future for Atlantic City. As has been said by many, all politics is local. Of all the levels of government, none is closer to the people than City Hall. The first step to a strong local government is a well-trained and mission-focused public workforce. And so this report identifies the means through which Atlantic City could build a stronger and more lasting municipal infrastructure, enhance training for senior managers, utilize new technologies for data collection and management, and restore civil service benefits and employee protections. In addition, we are pointing the way forward to better city planning to facilitate better coordination and cooperation between and among City Hall, CRETA, DCA, and other state, county, and local authorities. 
Over the past several years, the city's planning functions and capabilities had dwindled, even by example as the foreclosures, foreclosure crisis loomed large. The report looks at the need to diversify Atlantic City's economy, to protect it against any shocks that may hit an individual industry or sector. We're already seeing the city's economy transform before our eyes, with new small businesses opening along Tennessee Avenue, for example. Now is the time for us to place our bets on them, on the entrepreneurs who are willing to take a bet on Atlantic City. From governance and planning to business development, we must be innovative and forward-leaning so we can focus investments in a new and strategic way to lift up families and rebuild neighborhoods. Doing so will allow Atlantic City to tackle long-standing issues of unemployment, public health, and crime, and create a city that will provide lifetime opportunities for its young people. None of the glitz and luxury of the boardwalk has been able to erase the poverty that exists in its midst. But bringing all stakeholders together, from our offices to local health care providers, educators, police, and community-based organizations, we could create the programs and find the funding necessary to improve the quality of life for all who call this great city their home. And since we're at a school today, and happily so, let's keep in mind that there are 10,000 children who live in Atlantic City. They are often described as Atlantic City's forgotten or invisible citizens. Well, we see them, and we will not forget them. In accordance with the report's recommendations, to today I'd like to call on CRETA to come up with a way to dedicate funding for the benefit of youth in this city. This is, this is an investment in their future and in this city's future. We also point a way forward for partnership between and among the state, the Greater Atlantic City Chamber of Commerce, and the Atlantic City Schools to identify internships and entry-level positions for young people to start on the path to a good career and new ways to help those with criminal convictions on their records to get a job and a new chance at life. In fact, I just came from the convention center where a new uh, apprenticeship training program is being born. It's a venture among the State Department of Labor, CRETA, and Unite Here Local 54. Uh, it's, it's directed at hospitality jobs, and they list the criteria that you must have in order to apply for a, to get into the training program, and I'm proud to say that the, the, the last bullet point says something like, we actively encourage ex-offenders to apply for this training. And count us in. <laughs> and at the state level, we will look for ways to strengthen the hands and secure the futures of Atlantic cities and South Jersey's largest employers, the casinos, to ensure that the near complete collapse of the local economy we saw just a few years ago is never repeated. As you can see, Jim has had a lot on his plate over the past seven months. But the plan that he and his team, and I have to give a shout out, that team includes my dear friend DCA Senior Advisor Braxton Plummer. The plan that they have put forward is an all-inclusive blueprint for building a stronger city, a stronger regional economy, and a more secure future for the people who live and work here. Atlantic City has been counted out time and time again only to rise up time and time again to fight on. But I don't want to see this great and historic city on the mat again. I don't even want to see it on the ropes ever again. Everything Atlantic City needs can be found right here within its borders. Great people, yeah. Great people, a prime location, and people willing to be part of the action. This is not the end of our efforts here. This is only just the beginning. I remember Bill Gormley. Bill, you first told me I sat with you that it was going to take a while. Uh, and, and it has and it will, but we will get there. I want to close with the words of the late mayor, a former colleague of Bill's, Senator Jim Whalen, who believed in Atlantic City with all of his heart and soul. He gave the address at Stockton University, commencement address at Stockton University the year before I gave it last spring. And he encouraged the graduates, and I quote Jim, who was a dear friend to many of us, don't be afraid to make mistakes. You're going to make some. Keep going, and you will make some more. 
but go a little further and you will get it right. We have learned from the mistakes in Atlantic City's past, but we are going, in Jim's words, to go further. And together, we're going to get Atlantic City right. It is now my pleasure to introduce my partner in this administration, the singular Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as I gaze out of the windows, um, something that the governor started off with, and he said this historic city. There is no doubt there is no more historic city in our state than the city of Atlantic City. Amen. No, no, no doubt about it. And uh, as I gaze around the room, I see friends and colleagues and people that I've worked with through the decades. And I thought, why do we make so much of there being a north and south divide in our state? We are a state of nine million people. We could fit into the five boroughs of New York City. So I think that that uh, one step forward, and Jim certainly is going to describe a lot of detail for you today. I think it is time for us to stop thinking in terms of there are two sectors of this state. Um, you know, Atlantic City, I just read an article the other day that in Margate, we're going to have a battle over Lucy the Elephant once again. And uh, we all know that Lucy's been here since 1881, and we know that there were three elephants like Lucy, Lucy constructed in 1881, and they were designed to attract people to Atlantic City. So Atlantic City has been built on a foundation of tourism and visitation and just a seaside place. I mean, I'm sure with all of the asthma that we have today in the 2000s, years ago, people came to Atlantic City for the health benefits of the ocean. So there are a lot of assets to be built upon here. I was a member of the legislature when the deliberations began about a, quote, state takeover of Atlantic City. I belong to the group of legislators that did not believe in that terminology, takeover. Um, I spent a significant amount of time on the ground in Atlantic City while that legislation was winding through uh, the State House. Uh, Senator Ron Rice uh, and others, we had forums throughout the city to hear from the people of Atlantic City and to hear the distress uh, around being, quote, stripped of, quite frankly, what many believed was their citizenship. Uh, Governor Murphy and I, during the course of the gubernatorial campaign, made a commitment that when we were elected, it would end the prosecutorial mentality that, quote, state takeover seemed to imply. We um, are going to utilize and uh, and ut utilize the what that legislation is, but turn it around to be something that is positive for the people of Atlantic City. And uh, Jim has done a, a phenomenal job. And uh, you will all get to read during the course of the next few weeks the content uh, of the work that he has put together. Um, I think, Mayor Gilliam, you probably can bestow a key to the city upon Jim Johnson. He has left no stone unturned from health care to the older uh, residents of the town, employment and training, the school system, the faith-based, the, the, the small and um, medium-sized businesses in Atlantic City, uh, dealing with the public safety uh, sectors of the community, uh, the taxpayers dealing with the issue of homelessness and social services. So we have developed a comprehensive view 
of the city of Atlantic City, how the assets you have already can be built upon, and how we as the state government can be a partner with you. Early on in the governor's administration, uh, we convened a meeting with every cabinet member uh, in the governor's administration. They all assembled uh, uh, at a conference table and we called upon each commissioner to identify for us what resources and assets they had within their departments that could be utilized to support uh, the operation of the government here. So I want you to know that we are all in, not just the Department of Community Affairs, but the Department of Health, the Department of Education, the Economic Development Authority, the Environmental Protection Agency. And, you know, I administer a division that's called the Sandy Division back from 2012, and we even will have the presence of our Sandy Division personnel because you have not yet taken advantage of resources available to this town as a result of what occurred to you in 2012. So um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just happy to be here today. It's been a long time. Uh, the other thing the governor did, which we were all pleased with, uh, we brought back, quote, local control of this takeover law. And you know that uh, the prior administration had appointed a law firm here, and uh, not that I don't like law firms, but law firms don't know about grassroots community. And uh, I think that uh, that was the first and best decision that Governor Murphy made, and he made that decision from day one, that we would not have the law firm here, um, you know, op op operating your government on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Mayor Gilliam um, has described to us that this is the best it has been in Atlantic City in a while, because he also served on council. And uh, he said that it's been a breath of fresh air dealing with our administration, and it has been a breath of fresh air, us dealing with Mayor Gilliam. I also want to give a shout out to my Deputy Commissioner, Rob Long, because once we booted out the law firm, it became his job to continue the communication on a day-to-day -day basis with the officials of Atlantic City. So we look forward to uh, continuing this work. Uh, we have a comprehensive and strategic plan, and please know that uh, as all great cities, Atlantic City will reinvent itself, and it will reinvent himself, itself based on what we have learned, as the governor pointed out, the mistakes of the past. So um, let's uh, get to work. Thank you, sir. Three quick things before we bring the mayor up. Number one, we invited Lucy the Elephant to come up and make some <laughs> remarks, uh, but she will be available for Q&A, and don't forget, she forgets nothing. Uh, secondly, I mentioned Krita a couple of times, and I didn't see him before, but I now see its, its executive director, my dear friend Matt Doherty, is with us. Matt, thank you for what you're doing. <clears throat> And lastly, uh, we're thrilled to be at the Richmond Avenue School and with the administrators and the educators, but we're mostly thrilled to be here with a lot of your students, and so they're in the room with us, so let's hear it for you all. Uh, again, I can't say enough good things about the working relationship that our administration has had in our first eight-plus months uh, with the mayor and council in Atlantic City. It's my honor to introduce Mayor Frank Gilliam. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I even get into my spill, I got to make sure that I give a shout out to my um, council colleagues that are in the room. Can you please stand? For, for me, um, this has been a very arduous and um, in many ways interesting journey by coming into a, a office and having the zeal to move the city forward in ways and capacities that I think that the community deserves. But coming in and understanding that there was legislation in play that prohibited me and local entities um, from having the power to move their agenda. 
it wasn't until I believe the 17th of, uh, of January that I started to engage in the conversations with the governor's office as well as the lieutenant governor. And from that day forward, things begin to change. They changed in the matter where now we have a biweekly meeting with a representative from the DCA, which is Rob Long, and we're having open dialogue. And one of the most important things to success in rebuilding something is to have the ability to communicate and talk among each other, rather it's things that you can agree upon and things that basically you cannot. But I could say for the last nine months, my relationship with the state of New Jersey has been fruitful, and I stand before you as the mayor of Atlantic City. And it's not easy to basically stand before you and, 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 and tout the greatness. The city is great because of the people of the city. <clears throat> the, the, the city is great because of the resilience that the people have had during the turbulent times, the ups and downs, and it's very important for us to keep our eye on that perspective. Atlantic City will not, and I repeat, Atlantic City will not be the gem of the shore unless every aspect of Atlantic City is looked at equally, and that is our job to make sure the people of this community is never and will never be forgotten because they are the ones who make up this city. <clears throat> Along the campaign trail, we locked arms with the Murphy administration, and we said that we were going to basically make Atlantic City a much greater place than it has ever been. There were doubts in certain people's mind as to whether or not this administration was going to keep to its word. I can firmly tell you I've never had a doubt, because a lot of times where there's things basically being spewed in the, in the papers. I've always had a direct conversation, whether it was with Lieutenant Governor Oliver, as well as, as, well as uh, the Governor Murphy. And because today signifies the ribbon cutting of Stockton, it also signifies the opening of an opportunity and new day for Atlantic City. This has been a long time coming. Rather, it was done with the intention of improving the city there were things that were done that basically caused us to basically go back 10 steps. And this report, and I could graciously say that, Jim, it has been a, pl a pleasure and an honor to work with a gentleman that has so much passion and commitment for a community that he does not even live in. For him to basically do this on his own dime. Many of the things that he'll go over with you, uh, he'll tell you that he basically left no stone unturned. I have said this before in closed doors, and I'll say it publicly. This is probably one of the best moves that any governor has made to basically figure out how to have Atlantic City right itself. There's been governors among governors that actually came into office and never took the time to send a representative to find out what was happening on the ground. And this administration did that, and I got to give them kudos and a round of applause for that. Thank you. Atlantic City is probably the best city in the universe. And because we are the best city in the universe, we should take ourselves in a much more serious manner. We cannot. And we will not look at ourselves as a welfare case because we're not. We will not look at ourselves as a dilapidated town because we're not. Every town in the union has basically gone through ebbs and flows. But there's one town that I could guarantee you that will never fall into the Atlantic Ocean unless, unless the, the green gas and all the, the ecosystem changes. But from a standpoint of the true resiliency and the true heart and gut of what these people of Atlantic City represent. I am proud to say that I'm the mayor of Atlantic City. I am proud to say that I'm looking forward to the future and all the opportunities that are lie for not just us, but those young people that are sitting back there. And that's what this is all about, 
creating an opportunity and a window and an avenue to have young people in Atlantic City to look at their town and to be proud of what they are. Amen. And in closing, a famous individual, Khalil Gibran, said, what is work? Work is love made visible. And that takes a lot of love and a lot of commitment to make sure a city like Atlantic City finds its way back on top. And we're just about there, folks. The best has just begun. Thank you. A couple of quick things before we, we uh, hear from Jim. I think I might have heard you Frank, say, Frank, you wanted to make Atlantic City great again. <laughs> yes. Um, so well said, seriously, particularly your point about the future. I also, Sheila and I want to give a shout out to Atlantic County Prosecutor Tyner, and uh, right here in front, or front row. And uh, he's, he's visiting, uh, but I just was exchanging notes that yesterday. Mayor Albert Kelly is in for Bridgeton. And, uh, and uh, a cool program, the Economic Development Authority, came up with these things called innovation grants. And Atlantic City got one. Uh, and Bridgeton got one, and, uh, and the mayor and I were back and forth yesterday. Pretty cool stuff, $100,000 basically to put in the opportunity to grow your innovation economy. Um, uh, Frank mentioned the green gas that could throw us into the Atlantic Ocean. As long as we're here, we won't let that happen. But, but better than that, our Board of Public Utilities on Monday uh, made official the biggest solicitation in the history of the United States for offshore wind. Uh, and, and it's 1,100 megawatts, which is, trust me, if you don't know energy, that's big. Uh, and we announced that there are two more tranches to come, 1,200 in 2020 and another 1,200 in 2022. Why do I say that? My gut tells me Atlantic City is a huge winner uh, from the diversification. Another reason, another example of diversification, a company called Orsted, which is a European firm, has already opened up their office in New Jersey in Atlantic City. So that's a yet another example of where we see the diversification in this great community going. If you look at Jim Johnson's resume, it's hard to, to, to pick what's more impressive. And I won't go through it all, but this guy's basically done it all. Uh, private practice at the highest levels of, of law, uh, U United States government and the Department of Treasury at the highest levels, community and, and local and state service, uh, incredible education, pedigree, a family that's got an incredible rich history, um, a, a, a resident of Montclair, but I think his home away from home has become without question Atlantic City. Um, Sheila and I and our government, and I know Frank sees this every day, we're so uh, thankful that Jim took on this task and he's done, you know, we, all, we had high expectations. This guy has done an extraordinary job. There's just no other way to put it. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Johnson. So I have some prepared remarks, but before I get to my prepared remarks, I have something to say. Um, I've been listening to a lot of people talk about, and it's great to hear it, Jim Johnson's report and Jim Johnson's work. The, my work was actually listening to the people of Atlantic City. That was my job. And so what I hope with, with this report, what you get and what you will read is your own voices your own ideas with actually some meat on the bones to help move things forward. Um, that is, this is your report, and at times I was just your secretary. So it is um, a real, and I don't want to go on too long, because when you start at the end, you ought to start close to the end. Um, but it is a, a real joy to be here. Um, many of you know that I spent a lot of time in Atlantic City as a child. I haven't spent this much time in Atlantic City since I used to run away from Mr. Peanut. Uh, Atlantic City is it's huge in my family. So that when the governor asked me to take on this assignment, it was easy. And I thank you, Governor Murphy, for asking me to do this. Um, not for my salary, 
Um, That's for sure. <laughs> but also having the confidence that I could actually work with the team that you pulled together to bring the work at least to this age. The, um, it's really, really, really been meaningful to me. And one of the first and best things I think the governor asked uh, me to do is work with Braxton Plummer. Um, Braxton proved to be the administration's secret weapon as far as I was concerned because he seemed to be, no matter what position, no matter what party, no matter where you are in the city, everybody's friend. And one of the things that a piece of work like this requires is trust, and Braxton brought that to the table. So Braxton, thank you so much. You'll see in this report there's a fair amount of, of reference to building the infrastructure of the city, um, to working on capacity building. And that is, again, not from me, but very early on, the lieutenant gov governor sat in Braxton and me down and said, capacity. We're going to make progress if you build the city's capacity. And so what you see in this report that touches on that is because of the lieutenant governor. So we're grateful for your support, your insight, and at times your humor about the pace at which we were going. So thank you very much. <laughs> the, um, there, there are folks in the room who have not, and I'm just going to take one second because this is really, really important to me. As Braxton and I started to do the work, um, it became pretty clear that A, it was not a 45-day job. Um, we are, I think, at day 180, uh, which means I've earned 50 cents. Um, and B, that in the, uh, in, in the words of Jaws, we're going to need a bigger boat. Um, and so we had a, a lot of help from a person who's been my friend, was my colleague, actually was my employee at one stage, Matt Platkin. Um, I now work for him um, and his team. Matt, he deserves a shout out. <laughs> and his associate, um, Mackenzie Wilson, uh, who kept me right on New Jersey law. Um, and then there was a person at um, New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance, um, Katie Brennan. And what Katie did was she basically said, huh, this seems interesting. How can I help? And she kept helping, and kept helping, and kept helping. And for that, we we're very, very grateful. The, um, when we came on board, um, I th I, it is great to be at a point where the mayor is, is, um, is pleased with my work. Um, I wasn't so sure that the mayor was pleased with my coming. Um, but over time, we've had many wonderful and candid conversations, sometimes candid, more candid than wonderful. Um, and we are at a point now where we're both very excited for this city to move forward. Um, so let me tell you about where I think we are and what the steps, the steps are going forward. There's a lot of excitement, and you heard in the governor's um, description of all the things that are coming to Atlantic City, this is a time of extraordinary promise, and it is. It is exciting. But when you look at the report and you look at the record and the history and what's persisted in Atlantic City over generations, we all have to understand that this is a moment as well, this moment of promise, is also fragile. And the point of this work, and this was the governor's message to me, it was reemphasized by the lieutenant governor, is to work on a plan for all of Atlantic City. And that's what this is, to be comprehensive, to be inclusive, and to listen. Some of the da data that you'll see in the report um, are these. When the casinos came initially and they, they first opened up their doors, um, within the Casino Control Act, it said that these were going to be um, an unusual tool for redevelopment. The promise was to lift people up and all of Atlantic City up. At the time, the, the, um, the poverty rate was 25%. Today, it's more than 37%. We need a different way forward. 
It um, is a city with 10,000 children, and the governor has already talked about those children as considered the forgotten or invisible citizens. A third of them still live in poverty, more than a third. We need to lift this city up. We asked Rutgers to come in, and at no cost to us, the Rutgers School of Public Health um, studied the health effects, the health impacts, the life outcomes in Atlantic City. All of us should take a look. It's included in the report, a part of the Rutgers study. Atlantic City has among the highest rates of infant mortality in the state. It is almost double that of Newark. It is probably about 20% higher than that of Camden. And it is something that not only do we need to talk about, but we need to address. This needs to be about lifting everybody up. I say these, um, these, I raise these issues not to be a downer on a day that is hugely op optimistic, but the governor asked me to do a job, to look at the facts, to keep it real, and to then to be clear-eyed with everybody about the way forward. And I hope that this is what this report, which reflects all of your input, does. So let me describe really quickly, um, because I don't want the next person to say good evening after I finish. Let me describe really quickly um, what some of the highlights are. The governor has already talked about the fact that we want to strengthen city government. That work is underway. There's a commitment between the mayor and Rutgers to train all the city uh, council um, rather, this, the, the department heads um, in a 10-month training course. And they're going to be doing this still while they're working because they are committed to excellence in the city. That's going to get started in January. Um, we have commitments from Hard Rock, from Borgata, from Atlantic Care. And I see that Frank Blee is in the room from Atlantic Care, um, from Stockton, to help us build a tech internship program. And Barry Caldwell and Liberty Science Center, they're working together to build this. We're going to lift people up. We're creating pathways forward. We are doing what some, one of the great programs in the city is. We're connecting the dots. Connecting the dots is a small uh, STEM program in the city. Um, even that program can be bigger. So my hope. My hope is we won't even see the ropes in Atlantic City, um, that people will see that great things are happening. During the campaign and after, Governor Murphy said consistently, people will see that great things are happening in New Jersey. Well, people are going to see great things that are happening in Atlantic City. And it's not because of any one person or any one report. This report is an invitation to all of us. Come on in. The water's fine. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, uh, I'll tell you, could not have been better said. And again, Jim, thank you for everything. I mentioned Senator Chris Brown earlier, and I'm now told he's with us. Chris, where are you, man? He was here and left, so please tell him I said hello. Uh, you mentioned Atlantic Care and some of the other the casinos and others. I mentioned in a litany of the folks represented today. I should have said the private sector skin in the, is in the game here, both in the study as well as, more importantly, in the future. And you mentioned Braxton, and I just want to say this. I've known Braxton as a dear friend for going on five years. Braxton's the first day I've ever seen you in a suit. So this must be, this must be a big day. Love you, pal. With t time for a couple of questions. Is that okay with everybody up here? Absolutely. Please. Hi, Governor. Um, <clears throat> after all of the encouraging, hopeful words, and there were a lot, bottom line remains that this takeover still remains in place. And the recommendation in the report is for it to stay for the full five years unless ABC happens. Would it be fair to say that, that once you got in, opened the hood, started looking around, there was more, a lot more work to be done than you figured? No, I'll give you my answer, but I'd love Jim to come in and, and, and give you a little bit more meat on this. 
The answer is no. I think we had a pretty clear-eyed sense of what the challenges were. Clearly, Jim has studied it up and down with his team, and we have much more meat on the bones of what those challenges are. But here's what I was repelled by. Sheila and I, Sheila talked about this on the campaign trail, and this really bothered us, that this was a big footing of this community. And by the way, it's not most of the time. It's all of the time in this state when either a community or a school district has been taken over. It's, by the way, a community of color. And that bothered us deeply, and it still does. So, but I also said, and we said, that doesn't mean that Atlantic City doesn't need the state, that the state isn't going to stay the course and be a partner. So the graphic was always going from here to here. And that's what I think the relationship that Jim and Frank and their, their respective colleagues have established, and I think that's the spirit of the report. Is that fair? That's fair. Yeah, so that's my, please. I'll let one of these folks back here to give you a little bit. Like it be the yeah, we're, we're not going away. We're going to, uh, uh, you've heard a lot of words of optimism, and they're genuine, but you got to, that's why, as they say in the NFL, that's why, why you got to play the game. We got to go out and execute this plan. It's an extraordinary plan. We have to execute it. We're not going anywhere, and I say that in the very best sense of the word. We have Atlantic Cities back, and we're not going to, we're not going to give that up. Do you want to add anything, either one of you guys? Yeah, I, I would. Um, something phenomenal that has happened is uh, Atlantic City being able to come out from under its debt. And uh, Mayor Gilliam worked tirelessly with our Department of Local Government Services. And in fact, Atlantic City is moving towards a situation where they do not have to be a transitional aid city. And transitional aid cities are those that have, you know, un imbalances in their finances. Atlantic City has moved far beyond that. And they've done it by making wise management uh, decisions and making decisions about the expenditures that, that, that the city uh, possesses. And yes, taxes, the number of foreclosures in, in Atlantic City has been of consternation to me on a daily basis, but um, I think that through management, we have moved the city to a different place in terms of um, its, its financial resources. So um, Atlantic City is clearly on a path to wean itself off of transitional aid from the state. Frank, do you want to say Jim? In, in, in addition to that, um, we found ourselves uh, only receiving about three million. That's right. Three million in aid um, when it was prior years of up to 26 million. Uh, so I also want, want folks to understand that th this has not been an easy task. There has been some very hard decisions, specifically getting rid of our legacy debt, which was the health care, uh, the pension um, payments, as well as the uh, legacy issues that we had with some of the appeals. So we're, we're very um, gracious to the support that we've gotten, but we're also very um, clear on what our uh, steps next, moving forward and making the financial prudent decisions that we need to make for the taxpayers of Atlantic City. Really quickly, the, um, the report contains uh, uh, a couple of different goals, and these are related to each other. Um, if you look into the report, you'll see that, that over time, the rateable base of the city has decreased tremendously. And part of the, the goals and the purpose of the report is actually to increase the rateable base of property. Basically, the, the, um, so there's a tremendous amount of property that is in, owned by the state, either through CREDA um, or is owned by the city, and that's, taxes aren't paid on that. So the importance of getting a director of planning and really doubling down on dealing with all of the vacant property is actually to increase um, the amount of rateable property in the city. That is the way you end up um, removing the city from dependence on transitional aid, which I think in the report, we, it's, it's at the level of $9.1 uh, million, which is not a huge number in, in, in the grand scheme of things, to a point where it's, it's much closer to, to zero. But it's not simply by saying, you know, let's work the math on the budget side. We also need to work the math on the revenue side. And I think that we can do that. Well said. Somebody else, please. If you insist, it'll be the first off-topic question I've had in over eight months.
in Atlantic City. Well, you should. I, I I don't know whether or not you're going to be able to attend, uh, but we have uh, we have a pretty darn unified party. I'll let them obviously speak for themselves. And I think, uh, as I've said before, there's a lot of noise, but the substance is we have an overwhelming amount of agreement on uh, what it is to be a Democrat and where we want to take this party in this state. Uh, but we are having the state party uh, annual conference in Atlantic City uh, tonight and tomorrow. We have, and I'm not saying by one or two, we have meaningfully broken by measured in hundreds the all-time record for people showing up so i see a lot of unity there's an enormous amount of frustration directed at the president uh we have off year congressional elections you know top of the agenda is to get bob menendez reelected. elected there are five republican seats two of which are open including right here in this district uh there's an enormous amount of enthusiasm from the grassroots I think if you, if you come by, if you have a chance to come by, you're going to see a very fired up, passionate, and united Democratic Party. We'll stay just with the press for a minute, and then we can do some non-press stuff in a, in a second. Please, Brett. Um, no, I just, it just came to my attention today, and if, you, if that is in fact his voice, and the comments are, uh, if, you, if you hear those comments, they're comments that, are, that Sheila and I and our entire administration find completely, utterly unacceptable, inconsistent with not just our values, but New Jersey values, American values, and there's no choice as to the step that needs to be taken. But one, sorry, sir, someone who hasn't had a chance yet. I don't see any disconnect at all. This is a community that needs states, the state's help as a partner, not as a big footing, uh, jamming down, taking away, you know, taxation without representation. As I used to say, there were just literally that happened right after there were council elections. I forget the exact month, but you literally people just exercised their democratic uh, and, and, and the, their, their voices were taken away. I don't think Frank or any members of his council will say that their voice is not being heard and their rights are not being exercised right now. That's a big, big difference. Before we go to someone else, any, any other press before we go? One more, sir. There's some mention about police staff levels. There's almost no mention about fire department staff levels. That was a big concern when this yep. makeover happened that both departments would see significant cuts. Both have had cuts. Where are we now with the staff levels? Is this where I would just say one thing on the on the police side, and then I'd love Jim or Frank or Sheila to come in here. Um, uh, and that is, um, there's a big emphasis in the report on community policing, and, and as part of that, and 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 I, I I completely applaud that. But as part of that, the notion of deploying in that way in the right numbers is clearly a big objective here. I'd love you guys to either one of you to. So let me take the, the fire department first. Um, it was said a couple of times that Jim uh, was going to leave no stone unturned. There was one stone that's still in the middle of litigation, and so I left that one largely away. And so the report doesn't deal with fire department staff levels, but it does reflect the concerns that were raised by members of the union about um, a capital plan for their equipment. So it was limited in that regard. With respect to the, the, the police department, um, community policing is a very, very important goal. Um, but the report had to run a very um, careful line because budgets are limited. And so there are a lot of things that have to be done within um, our current budgetary level, levels. And if we can find additional money, then there are policy choices that m might um, affect where we go with the police, police staffing levels. But we're in a circumstance where many of the people in City Hall have not had raises in a very, very long time. 
and we have, um, when you look at the report and you see that the public health function has, um, has withered away, uh, that the planning department, which is going to be so vital to uh, building up the, the tax base that I was just talking about, um, they have also withered away. So we have to take these things sort of step by step and make this kind of a balance, rather than saying we're going to deal with this silo and then maybe we'll figure out the rest. We've got to look at it holistically, and that's how we landed where we did. Yeah, and, and to that very point, um, it's, it's important for folks to realize that there's not just one or two departments that basically make up a city. Uh, there is a myriad of departments that make a, a, a city work well. Um, and many may not know that there's been actually gutting of departments that have basically caused us to have insufficiencies in certain areas. So we're also looking at ways to basically bring back um, vibrancy to de certain departments. We heard of the report that uh, Atlantic City has some of the worst health conditions. Um, we're looking to build um, some consensus in bringing back a stronger health department with uh, more folks that concentrate on uh, helping people in Atlantic City. And, and lastly, this report is only a road map. It will not work. And I repeat, it will not work unless we break the silos that have caused Atlantic City to reach uh, such a low. But I'm very optimistic based on the uh, first nine months that I've been in, rather it's been the state, CRDA, uh, the county. Um, folks have been very open-minded to making sure that we move in the direction that we think is best for um, everyone. Well said. So just a couple of uh, citizens have a question or a quick comment. Yes. How are you? Amen. Well received, well researched. No. A lot of books that sit in the library that don't get read or don't get acted on. What are we going to do with this report in the sense of we have Mr. Long, who is the day to day man for making all the major decisions? We have a lot of recommendations. We have a point person specifically to follow up on these recommendations. Number one, and I don't know what I'm doing a year from today exactly, but the notion of I'm in Atlantic City literally all the time, as my, my team knows better than anyone, so I'm honored to come back. I'd like Sheila to answer that, but before she does, can we just get both of these out, and then we're going to wrap. Thank you. Yeah, Marcus Hayne, I'm from your team. Hey, Marcus. Yep. Great. I'm going to have, do you want to, do you want to hit both those? Or? Yes. Okay. I, I first want to talk about um, not forgetting. One of the things you will read in the report is a recommendation that the Department of Community Affairs establish an Atlantic City Project Office. That will be staff wholly dedicated to working with Mayor Gilliam, working with the uh, stakeholders in Atlantic City, et cetera. These would be people who do nothing else as their DCA job than to focus on Atlantic City. And, uh, I, you know, I had, I had learned that when the legislation was first implemented, the people who were here implementing it had never even set foot inside of City Hall. That will not happen in the Murphy Oliver administration. <laughs> The other aspect of uh, the situation and dilemma, and that is disconcerting to me, I see the low salaries that are paid, not just in the educational system here, but in the public jobs. And we are strapped with a piece of legislation that was signed into law. The only way you reverse what, says, what it says in that law is if the state legislature made a decision that they were going to amend, that they were going to restore civil service. Um, these are some of the reasons why I, as a legislator, did not vote for that legislation. And we tried to get others to come along with us. But as they say in the vernacular, it is what it is. But what we are committed to, and you will read about 
establishing a process where there is transparency, where there is openness, and that people are given equal access to go up the ladder in the absence of civil service. But it is something that we are well aware of. Uh, you know, I've got a desk drawer full of postcards. And, and I'm sure they have come from not just the uh, Education Association here, but some of the other labor groups. Um, you know, we're not happy about that, but that is what we're stranglehold with. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to shut it down because I'm told that we're, we're, we're born our own welcome. Thank you, <laughs> Richmond Avenue team, for having us. Thank you all for coming out. God bless Atlantic City. Thank